1 through 10. Pronounce that Dalmathua, Dalmathua, Dalmathua. Huh? You're on. Oh. Never mind. I'll make it up. <laughs> Hello there, Carol. I see your own. <clears throat> Hope Greg is with you. It's just about time for our session tonight. I thought I'd get us uh, get on and get set up. I see other people are, are joining us. Got a bunch of people joining now. Tom Sutherland, John Phillips, uh, Kenneth Millard, Megan Herndon just joined us. Joanna Crooks. This is awesome. We're going to have a good group tonight. I tell you, our new church app is incredible. We just got a, a push, a notification that said I'd be doing my Bible study at 7 o'clock. Jessica's on the ball with that. And uh, it came in so handy last Sunday morning. We had a problem with live stream, as a lot of you know. And uh, the tech team was incredible. They tried all kinds of different things to to, uh, to get us up and running live. And then right at the last minute, Becky could see it wasn't going to happen. So she said, let's record it and show it at uh, 11.30 or 12, whenever we can get it loaded. And uh, Jessica put out a notification to everybody on the app that that was happening. Susan posted it on the website. And uh, so lots of people knew about it in, in real time. We only had one or two people try to contact us to tell us that we had problems because we had, had told everybody we had problems. I'm going to do just a couple of announcements tonight as we get started and as pe more people join us. Um, the first, I've got some good news. Um, the bishop put out the guidelines for Holston Conference Church's reopening. Those have only been out a couple of days now, but uh, there's a process that's lined out in that that includes writing and developing a church plan for reopening, and we already had our plan developed, and you all saw a lot of that in the video, and uh, the, the sort of the summary is that if you get your plan approved by the district superintendent, you can, can reopen for worship as early as June 21st. Um, so we're we're hopeful that that'll happen. We've submitted it to our district superintendent, and uh, he'll be looking it over, and also just you know considering all the situation here in Hamilton County as to whether or not our churches can reopen. But twenty-three page guidelines. The guidelines that came out from the conference, Becky just said, was twenty-three pages. Uh, our our uh, plan for our church was considerably shorter than that, but anyhow. It's good to have that uh, those guidelines out, and we'll keep you posted. Obviously, if uh, if we get that approved and we do start June 21st, remember there'll be six worship services: two at 9:30, two at 11:15, and those services will have the style of worship that we've had in those in the past. Keep in mind we can't have a choir at 11:15 in the sanctuary because of of social distancing, but we'll do the best we can to make that service feel like a blended traditional service. And then the new services will be at 1 o'clock, one in the commons, one in the sanctuary, and they'll be just like the 1115 services. So uh, if uh, if 1 o'clock works for you, we uh, we hope you'll come to those 1 o'clock services uh, to make room for, for people in the, in the other four. Jimmy Ovington just asked, will live streaming continue? It absolutely will. Uh, we were live streaming before the COVID hit us, and, and, and we've just gotten better with our live streaming, so we definitely will continue it. In fact, we're encouraging people, if, 
if they don't feel safe coming to church, if they're in a high-risk age bracket or have underlying health issues, by all means, stay home and live stream. Those are beautiful services. Uh, the, the live stream services are are really, really good. So enjoy those. One other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, Nathan's already planned the sermon series for July. It's really going to be a good series. It's called The Four P's of the Bible, and it's the, the people, the places, the parables, and the prayers of the Bible. I'm going to be preaching one of those Sundays, and we're putting together something called the Summer Bible Challenge. Our daily devotions will be written around those four Ps, um, and uh, Kathy Baker and I will be doing a, a video each week to kind of set the stage for our more detailed study along uh, those, those four Ps. So you'll hear more about that as we go along. We're encouraging small groups who will have to be continuing to use Zoom and and uh, Facebook Live and things like that online. Uh, we're, we're encouraging them to participate in this uh, Summer Bible Challenge uh, for their small group program. And that's why Kathy and I will be doing the, uh, the videos each week to, to provide assistance with that. Okay, let's, let's get into our lesson tonight. We've got a, we got a lot of people on, and that's great. I'll tell you, I know some of you aren't on live tonight, but you're going to watch this Bible study later. There are actually more people, considerably more people, who go in and watch it later, and that's awesome. So welcome to you all whenever it is that you come in and see this. We're in Mark chapter 8. Becky is all set to read for us tonight. There's, people have been saying hi to you, Becky. Jean <laughs> Ford said hi a minute ago. Uh, I always like to go back to the previous chapter because... Some of you may have missed chapter 7 last week. In it, we read how Jesus announced that all the traditions the, of ceremonial cleanliness can get in our way of loving God. He, he pointed out how uh, some of those were, were like the, the rules for clean and unclean. He, he talked about how uh, it's not what goes in our mouth that makes us unclean, meaning having uh, eaten from a dish that had touched a Gentile and was therefore ceremonially unclean. Rather, he says it's what's in our heart that makes us unclean because what's in our heart may lead us to do something wrong. Uh, Jesus went outside the area of Galilee where he's been ministering and he went to a place called Tyre. Now that's uh, up on the, I almost said on the left, it's on the west along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. If you're looking at the map, it is on the left. But that's uh, the significant thing about that that journey and his discussion there is he's in a place there that was predominantly Gentile. It isn't Jewish. And this woman comes in and asks him to heal her little girl. And Jesus said, you know, it's not fair to throw the, the children's uh, food to the dogs. It's kind of, a, kind of a little bit of a slam to us Gentiles. But the woman had such a beautiful answer. She said, well, yeah, but the little children, whatever they drop on the floor, and what she's referring to is a lot of the Jews were wasting this food. You know, Jesus had come as their Christ, their Messiah, and a lot of them were not accepting him. And so she's saying, whatever the little children drop on the floor, surely the dogs can eat that. And Jesus told her because of her beautiful answer, he would heal her daughter and did. He left there and uh, and came across to the that place I referred to earlier as the Decapolis. Uh, ten Greek cities had been built around and south of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it, it, it was there that Jesus had healed the man who had uh, the multiple um, evil spirits. And now when Jesus comes back, he is really, really well received. This is significant. With Jesus going from one Gentile area directly to another Gentile area, he's sending us a message, not just about the the food, no food being unclean, but who, what else is Jesus saying is not unclean? Can somebody answer that for me? Hi Dan Young, good to see you again tonight. In other words, Jesus has said, don't worry about the food. The ceremonial food laws have served their purpose. Don't worry about that. It's, there's, no food is unclean. 
Uh, but he also, by going from one Gentile area to another, he's demonstrating something else about spiritual cleanliness and uncleanness. Nobody's jumping on that one just yet. What Jesus is saying in a subtle way is that no people are unclean. Um, now that was, yes, Tom's referring to the Gentiles. He's, he's, he's showing us that the Gentiles are not unclean. They, he's going to focus on ministering to Jewish people. That's who he came for. But the Gentiles, the Jews were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles and uh, yes, uh, Patricia just said the, the good news was sent for all. And that's exactly right. So now we're in chapter 8 tonight. We're, we're going to do this whole chapter. And uh, we'll start with the first 10 verses. By the way, if your Bible has a, as you grab your Bible tonight, if you've got a study Bible or a Bible that's got maps in it, uh, I want to look at something in the, in, the, in the maps a little later. Becky's going to read Mark 8. Verses 1 through 10. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. <clears throat> if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way <coughs> because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Del Malthusa. Um. I just saw that Charlie Spencer joined us. Charlie is a good friend of mine. We worked together at TVA for years. And mine. And a good friend of Becky's. Becky just chimed in and said, and mine. Charlie, she claims you. <laughs> uh, he's a member up at Signal Crest United Methodist Church and has been involved in lots and lots of ministries around Chattanooga. Good to have you on board with us, Charlie. Uh, Jean Gillis joined us as well. Um, what's your first impression upon hearing this passage that Becky just read? about feeding 4,000 people. When you hear that, especially those of you who have been in several of these sessions with me, what comes to mind? Something struck me as I read that uh, preparing my lesson plan this week. Wondering if the same thing struck you. <clears throat> Probably be scary if our minds were thinking alike, so you may not want to claim this. Anything particular strike you guys as you as you started to read this story about Jesus being out in a place away from everything and and a great crowd had gathered and and uh, four thousand people and it's like ooh we're about to feed some people here. What what comes to mind? Okay, somebody's gone. Jimmy went right to the, right to the kind of one of the stories there. Like Jesus, we're supposed to have compassion and feed the hungry. That's a good thought to have. That's that's not the one that I had, Jimmy. The thing that popped into my head was, wait a minute, we've already had this story. <clears throat> we've already Jesus has already fed a big crowd. Uh, as we get older, I don't know if any, none of you are probably as old as me, but as we get older, take it from me. Uh, you start to kind of tell the same stories. Um, and sometimes when I'm teaching, I'll say, have I, have I already told this story? Um, 
I've kind of gotten to the point that I don't ask because I want to tell the story whether I've told it before or not. But, uh, and, and that happens as we get even older, is we just go ahead and tell our story over and over. I can remember being a young adult and noticing that my dad was, uh, he was starting to tell the same stories a lot. And uh, I was very, very polite and respectful, and I would sit and listen to those stories uh, knowing exactly all the details and how the story was going to end. Our son, John, when I start to tell a story that he's heard before, that I've told before, he just interrupts and says, Dad, you've told that before. And sometimes he'll say a dozen times. But <laughs> anyhow, uh, I don't think Mark is suffering from old age here and telling stories over and over again. This is probably two different incidents. Before he fed... 5,000. Some people, some scholars say, you know, uh, this may have been two different tellings of the same event, and that's possible. But the text that follows this feeding of the 4,000 tells us that it was two different events. So if we're going to believe Mark, we have to think that it was two different times. I want you all to list some similarities between the two feedings. What, what was similar about what occurred? And then right after that, in fact, you can go ahead and start doing that now if you want, type in some of the differences. They are similar in some respects, but they're different or unique in other respects. So use your comment field to, to tell me some of the similarities and some of the differences. If you just throw out something, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll figure out whether you meant it was a similarity or a difference. Tom Sutherland pointed out as one of the things we get from that story that there was more than enough, and that's a similarity between the two stories. Uh, there was food left over in both of those stories. One of the hardest things about Facebook Live teaching is waiting for the answers to come. Okay, the disciples questioned Jesus about where they were going to get uh, food to feed the, that many. Uh, Nelda says, oh yeah, there were seven basketfuls of uh, leftovers with this feeding, 12 in the, in the previous one. That's a, a similarity and a difference. Ah, Joanna says there was, the menu was the same, wasn't it? Bread and fish. Um, Ah, there's a difference. Jimmy Ovington says, this is more for Gentiles. That's exactly right. The first feeding would have been Jewish people. And he was in an area that was strongly Jewish. Now he's in a Gentile area. Uh, uh, Patricia says, there were two fish in the first story and a few fish in the second. Mark doesn't give us a number. Uh, another similarity, I don't think somebody has mentioned this yet. Um, in both cases... The apostles, uh, Patricia pointed out that they asked where they were going to feed all these people. People, the disciples, were focused on on what they didn't have. They were focused on the lack of resources. Uh, Gala Davini zone, five loaves, two fish versus seven and a few. Thank you, Gala. Hope Warren is there watching with you. Uh, we had, uh, we had, uh, a lesson in that, in that Jesus says, what do you have? Well, i got these fish and loaves, that's all. And he takes it and makes it enough. That's a great lesson for us. In the church, in our lives, we should focus on what we have and trust God to make it be enough. The apostles see the problem. They don't see the solution. Uh, Jesus, as somebody has said, takes a little and makes a lot in both of those. In one case, there's 5,000. Another one, 4,000. As Jimmy says, these are Gentiles. Uh, in the first one, he organized them into fifties and hundreds, and in the 4,000, he just had them sit on the ground. I've heard people say organizing them into fifties and hundreds sounds like he was Methodist. I don't know if he would claim that or not. The 12 baskets full that were left over, uh, some people say that that, because it was a Jewish crowd, the 12 represent the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, because this crowd is, is Gentile. Some people say the seven baskets full that were left over the seven kind of comes from numerology, and seven is a number that means complete. 
uh, it's all there. Uh, and so it would, both of those tell us that there was a ton of food left over. And the point, I think Tommy made this early on, is Jesus gives abundantly. There's not just enough to get by. Jesus gives abundantly. Um, I, I see a strong connection between Jesus offering the crumbs falling on the on, from the plates of the children of Israel to the dogs, the Gentiles in the previous chapter, and this case here now where he's feeding Gentiles, not just feeding them food, but he's giving them the good news. He's teaching them. Um, and so I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think Mark, I think Jesus did it this way so that we could see his point about uh, no people are unclean. Becky, are you ready for some more reading? Yes. Uh, verses 11 through 13. If you all would, read along with me. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Okay. Um, do you ever ask for a sign? Um, we're really not supposed to do that. Uh, and, and this crowd comes to Jesus, the Pharisees. Remember who the Pharisees were. They were, they were people who they were deeply, deeply religious Jews. They, uh, they believed in the entire Old Testament where the Sadducees only believed in the, in the Torah, the first five books. Uh, the Pharisees were very conservative politically. They didn't think the Romans should be there. The Sadducees uh, were very liberal politically. They, they buttered up to the Romans. Uh, but the Pharisees thought that you earned your salvation. If you were good enough, God would love you and and you would have their view of eternal life. Some of these Pharisees uh, don't want to believe. They're, they're questioning Jesus. They're trying to trap him. Uh, and so now they come and ask for a sign. Uh, sometimes I ask for a sign of acknowledgement that God is present in something. God, if you're in this, just, just let me know. Uh, and I've missed signs left and right. Uh, I love the story of uh, of uh, oh the judge in the Old Testament. His name just left me. Uh, Gideon. Gideon. I was about to ask Becky who gives out those Bibles. That's the the, the Gideons. And bless Gideon's heart. He was a he, he was uh, he he was being asked to be a leader at a time when I think it was the Midianites who had taken over the land and they were powerful. And God told him, hey, raise an army and I'll go with you. And he goes, you know, God, if you're in this thing, I'll put a, a fleece out tonight. And if, if you're in this thing, it'll be wet tomorrow morning. It was wet the next morning. And he said, okay, maybe that's God and maybe it's not. I'll tell you what, I'll put it out tonight. And if it's dry tomorrow, then I'll trust that God's in it. God didn't like that because Gideon, he was a good person, but he just didn't have the faith to say, okay, it's God. And sometimes all of us kind of want to see a sign, some indication. Mark eight twelve, Becky read, says, Jesus sighed deeply. When someone, quote, sighs deeply, what does that usually mean? What, what, what makes us sigh deeply? You know, that's like, why would Jesus do that? You guys are waiting me out here. There it comes. Uh, yeah, there's a good old Southern expression. Joanna Crook says, he was put out with them. That's exactly right. Frustration, Patricia says, yes. Disappointed, all of those, exactly. Uh, whenever, here he's been doing sign after sign after sign. He's just fed 4,000 men. Who knows how many people, If you uh, when you count the, the women and the children, and here they come saying, could you give us a sign? He's healed people. 
He's, uh, he's brought a little girl back to life from death. Uh, and now they're asking for a sign. Yeah, I can see him go. And then he says, uh, what they're doing is they're wanting a sign that would prove beyond all doubt that Jesus is really from God. They're blind to the signs. They're not going to see them. Um, it's not that they cannot see them. It's that they will not see them. And that's the worst kind of not seeing. Uh, Jesus was, was not about to cater to their request for another sign. And, and he, he, uh, he says, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given. Got in the boat and left. Uh, that's pretty much in their face. They, if they wanted a sign, they would have seen them all over the place. And if they believe, they're going to see many, many more signs. Becky, how about 14 through 21, please? The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many baskets full did, of pieces did you ever pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? <laughs> oh, uh, I mentioned when I introduced this Gospel of Mark that Mark, the writer, doesn't always uh, put the apostles in the best light. This is one of those cases where they should be embarrassed. Jesus is teaching something spiritual, and they're locked into the physical thing. By the way, for those scholars who say, well, the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000 was the same event told two different times, I can't imagine that Jesus would refer to it in this discussion with the apostles this way if there were just one event because he asked them how many was left over when I fed five how many were left over when I fed four thousand so I think that clearly there were two events here his point that he's trying to make is there's bread of plenty I have given you all kinds of sign surely you guys get it but they don't uh, they're in the boat and this happens in other gospels as well uh, where Jesus says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Um, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And let's see, does this say in of Herod? Yes, and that of Herod. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, there's the religious and political uh, rulers of their time. We know what yeast is. It causes dough to rise. Um in Jesus' time, you couldn't run to the store and get that little packet of Fleischmann's and put in your roll dough. Uh, and by the way, whenever you take the yeast, uh, I've seen Becky do this. You put it in a little cup of warm water. You stir it up. It dissolves. It's got all this dough mixed up. And then you just kind of stir it in the dough. And before you know it, it is all over that dough. It doesn't just stay in a little pocket of the dough. It goes all over it. And I've seen she puts that in the refrigerator and it rises. I have seen it spill over from the container because and it'll be in a huge mixing bowl. But it, it, it rises a great deal. It's very obvious when it does that. Jesus is saying, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. In his day, he couldn't go down to the store and buy a little packet of Fleischmann. So he would, they would take a plug of dough and keep it as a starter. And so when somebody new was making uh, Vicki Holland is watching tonight too. Hey, Vicki. Uh, whenever uh, people wanted to mix uh, yeast into their dough, they would take a piece of starter dough that had yeast in it, 
mix it in part of it, and then just like our Fleischmann's, away it get, would go. Yeast always spreads. And there's something else here. When Jesus says, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees, he's saying their teachings will spread very rapidly. But he's also saying they're not good. Um, uh, Jewish people had no problem at all with eating bread with yeast in it, um, risen bread, until time for Passover. And at Passover, <clears throat> they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread, remembering that Passover whenever they had to escape from Egypt. And <clears throat> on that day, or as they prepared for that day, they would uh, go look through the house and find the dough that had yeast in it. And they would take it and put it in an isolated place away from their house. And then they would search the whole house to make sure there was no leavened dough or bread. They would even sweep the floor to make sure there were no crumbs of that left. And in that context, yeast was bad. If yeast was found in your home, you were, you were breaking the Passover and would have been unclean. And so, in that context, yeast is bad. And that's how Jesus is using it here. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. And the apostles, blessed their hearts, said, it's because we don't have any bread. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's why he's talking about being careful of the yeast. Uh, Jesus is talking about spiritual bread and can't get them to think on the conceptual spiritual level with him. Let's see what comes next. Remember this point. The apostles want to see. They're not like the Pharisees. They want to see, but their vision of Christ is not yet clear. They're learning a lot from him. They're with him every day, but their 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 vision of Christ is not complete. But Becky, if you would, read verses 22 through 26. They came to the Sida, and some people brought a blind man and begged <clears throat> Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. <clears throat> His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, Don't even go into the village. <laughs> this is another one of those cases where Jesus is trying to avoid becoming just the miracle worker, where everybody who comes to him aren't seeking spiritual truth, but they're just looking to be healed. He has compassion. This man comes to him. He's blind. Where does he take the man? Notice this. This is... He's done this once before. Do you notice where he takes the man before he heals him? Oh, yeah. Uh, Joanna says, out of town. He takes him away from the town, away from the village, away from the people, outside the village, Gala tells me. He, the, Jesus wants this to be private. It's a personal healing of compassion. He's not healing this man for any reason other than he wants him to be able to see. Uh, so, this is the only healing that I know of in the Gospels that takes part in two stages. Initially, the man can see partially, but not fully. Uh, I can identify with that. I bet there's several of you. I've got these glasses on, and this eye has a contact in it. And if I, if I take out that contact, I'm like the man. I, the tree, the, the men walking around, or people walking around, look like trees. Uh, and the man explains that to Jesus, said he can't see clearly, and so then Jesus completely heals him, and the man's vision, he's 20-20 now. And he says, don't even go back into town. You know, don't, I don't want to spread this thing about miracle working and healing. Uh, go on your way. It, 
I don't, I don't know if I've caught this before. I caught it this time. <laughs> this is talking about the apostles. The healing is there for us to see how they're having trouble understanding. They can see partially. Eventually, they'll get it. Eventually, they're going to see Jesus. And, in, and this happens very soon. We get an indication that they really are starting to have their vision completely uh, cleared. Uh, Mark's got a lot of... Uh, I guess this time I'm studying it, I'm seeing more reasons for things happening in the order they happen than I have before. It's it's brilliant the way one thing leads to another. And there's something else that leads on about this thing about clear vision. Becky, would you read verses 27 through 30? Jesus now, said, hold on, honey, if you would. Uh, while she's reading, if you've got maps in your Bible, uh, turn to, they're usually over in the back, um, but turn to your map, if you would. And now, Becky, if you would, continue reading. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. You know, this is, uh, I think, the first time that Peter's answered a question correctly. Uh, there should have... Uh, oh, Larry Sanders is on tonight. Good to see Oh, and Shirley Ball. Man, we've got a good crowd tonight. This is awesome. Uh when Peter answered that, there should have been a bell in the background going, ding, 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 ding. Peter, Peter's right. Yes, confetti should have been thrown up in the air. Uh, not as much in, in Mark's gospel, but in the other gospels. Peter's almost the foil. Jesus asks questions. Peter answers wrong, wrongly. And then uh, Jesus corrects Peter so that we all understand. This is a, this is a beautiful setting. It's almost like he's taken his apostles on a retreat. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, look for Caesarea Philippi, and I'll, I'll direct you. Uh, now, this is don't be looking at Paul's journeys or, or any of that stuff or the Old Testament. Look at the New Testament Israel, New Testament Palestine. Or some Bibles will have a map called the Ministries of Christ. I've got an atlas here that I was going to hold up, and... Uh, I realized I'd just confuse you. I don't know if you are aware of this. A couple of people have pointed it out to me. But on an iPad of the version of mine and Facebook Live, it's like you're looking in a mirror. And that looks like it's my left hand, but it's actually my right. So if I hold up a map of uh, Caesarea Philippi, it's going to be, you know, west is going to be right instead of left. And But uh, Caesarea Philippi, is uh, is way up north. It's like if you're on that map of Palestine or Israel and you go up from the Red Sea, I'm sorry, the Dead Sea, up the Jordan River, you come to the Sea of Galilee. And if you just keep going north of the Sea of Galilee, you come to Caesarea Philippi. It is right on the border with Syria. Modern day, it's close to the border of Syria. Um uh, Yes, Jimmy Hovington says stage right. I have to know whether to say right or stage right. Uh, so, Caesarea Philippi is this beautiful place. Um, it's, uh, it's very green and lush there. It's the headwaters of the, these little streams that come out of, out of Caesarea Philippi make up the, the beginning of the Jordan River. Uh, there are mountains that come down right to that little tiny lake. And uh, Jesus there with only his apostles asked them a couple of questions. The first question is easy. It's a fact question. Who do people say I am? Oh, some say you're, uh, some people say you're the prophet, like Elijah, one of the other prophets. Uh, some people say John the Baptist. Herod was afraid Jesus was John the Baptist. But then Jesus asked the tough question. He says, but what about you? 
Who do you say I am? I'm guessing that he had to wait a lot longer than I do on Facebook Live to get uh, comments coming back in. I'm betting, guessing, that it got really quiet in that little group for a while. And then Peter, and I may be wrong because Peter was so impulsive, he may have blurted it out immediately. But Peter said, you are the Christ. Beautiful uh, affirmation. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew Mesha, uh, Messiah, God's Son, the Anointed One, the Appointed One, uh, um, the King of Kings. All of those prophecies have come true in Jesus the Christ. Finally, the apostles are starting to see beyond physical bread and what's on the surface. They're seeing beyond the literal meanings and they're getting the spiritual meaning. Uh, they are beginning as the man that was healed in two stages. They're beginning now to see clearly. Uh, now that they're grasping who Jesus is, Christ has to show them what that means. What does it mean to be the Messiah? Becky, if you would, read 31 through 33. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, <coughs> the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Well, uh, ouch. Yeah, ouch, <laughs> Becky says. Peter's, uh, Peter's fame, the gold star that he got to hang on the wall, just got ripped off. He, his fame was short-lived, I guess. But uh, actually, Jesus is teaching a powerful, powerful lesson in this discourse with Peter. Remember, Mark's gospel was written first. He, he tells us, bang, 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 uh, just the facts in a way. Uh, other Gospels tell us some more of the detail. Uh, when, when Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ, one of the other Gospels says that Jesus said to him, Peter, you didn't get that by human knowledge. And that's not a put down. That's not saying, Peter, you're not smart enough to know that. What Jesus was saying is, you understand more because of God's Spirit being in you, you've been given this knowledge. Uh, it didn't just come to you through study or thinking. This is, this is beyond humans to know that. Mark doesn't tell us that part. But Mark does tell us this second part where Jesus now tells us that he must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. It says he spoke plainly about it, which means he just used those words. I'm going to be killed. I'll be taken out and crucified, and then I'll rise from the dead. He's going to tell them this three times, and when the time comes, they're still having trouble uh, soaking that in. When Peter hears that, that's the first time Peter has heard that his Lord, this guy that he's just proclaimed as the Christ, has to die. Jess says he's telling them about what it means to be the suffering servant. That's exactly right. And Peter rebukes him. Don't say that. And then Jesus comes right back and says, Peter, that's not, that's not God talking through you now. That's Satan. Uh, to give Peter a little bit more credit, it also is human nature. Uh, and it, he loves Jesus. He, they're, they're, he's his rabbi. Jesus is his rabbi, his teacher. Uh, his wonderful friend, and so it's only natural that Peter would, would say, no, 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 and I think the reason Jesus says it's Satan is I think Satan is tempting him to say, you know, maybe I'll just hang around. Maybe three years are not enough. Remember, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, three times he re rebuked Satan, and it says Satan left him and then waited for an opportune time. I think this is one of those times where Jesus felt temptation from Satan through Peter's words. Get behind me, Satan. Uh, 
wasn't he wasn't saying that Peter was Satan. He's saying, as you speak that, as well intended as it is, it's tempting me not to do my Father's will. Jesus went to the garden the night before his death, hoping and praying, literally, that uh, he would be spared this horrible death. Becky, one more. Uh, there's a chunk here. If you would read uh, uh, 34 through 9 1. Just begin 9. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Wow. That is a really, really powerful uh, passage. And 9-1 goes with eight, uh, the, the latter part of 8. This is, uh, as I say, some of the hardest words in Scripture. Taking up our cross means going ahead for the kingdom even when it could cost us our life. We trivialize that, that phrase, taking up our cross. You know, I'm left-handed and I've heard people say, well, that's a cross I bear. <laughs> no. Uh, or maybe some, some illness or something. Is, well, that's my cross. No, our cross is not something foisted on us. Our cross is taking it up. It's, it's, it's stepping out. There are people today in parts of Africa, in Pakistan, other parts of the world who die when they profess faith in Christ. That's taking up your cross. Most of us will never be in places where... Uh, living a life of faith will jeopardize our lives. So our call is not, it is not to die for Christ. To take up our cross doesn't mean we have to die for him. It may be a harder thing. We're called, when we take up our cross, to live for him. Committing ourselves to Christ's teachings, knowing those teachings, and doing them. Uh, it's not easy. He calls us to free ourselves from the things of the world, and to live as one of His. Folks, we try to keep these to 45 minutes, and it just turned 46 minutes. So we're going to end right there. Next week, we'll do Mark chapter 9. And it's been awesome having all of you on tonight. What a good group. And I look forward to seeing other people come on this week and hit it uh, on our app and on our website. You guys take care. God bless you.